<laughs> you don't want to participate. Oh, man. Oh, man. All right, guys. All right. Let's see. If this starts working, I need confirmation that people can hear me before I start rambling on because it's normal. Let's pause that. Reduce that. Perfect. All right, guys. If you can right, hear guys. me, right. please, Let's please, please let me if know. This starts Comment working. I need down confirmation that people below. Can Comment down below. Let's see who we got in here. What's up, guys? Come on. Talk to me. Let me see if I can hear myself. I start ramp yes, I can. I can hear myself. Welcome back. Let's see. We got Whisper Jet on board. I like that name, Whisper Jet. That's kind of cool. And we got Brian Mace. Hello from Los Angeles. Waiting, waiting for a flight to Phoenix. Oh, perfect. Welcome. I don't know how much time you got. Hopefully we can ramble on. I have 20 different topics that I want to talk about in today's video. Uh, or today's video. I've been filming videos. I'm currently sitting staring at a camera. Uh, 20 different topics to talk about today if we get around to them. Uh, let's see what else. Do we need a bigger wing the heavier you are? Yes, Mark. You do need a bigger wing the heavier you are. Amber, what's happening? When are you and Michael going to come hang out with us again? It's been a long time since we've seen you guys. I saw the new property. It looks great. Super jealous. I got to come fly there with you guys. See? Angle looks good. You guys got my face. I have my beard this time. If you guys remember the last live stream, I had trimmed the beard off and was looking like a completely different person. I will not be making that mistake again. You guys let me know just how bad of a mistake that one was. So don't you worry, I won't do that again. Oh man, oh man, Travis Martin. What's up, Travis? I hope to see you again soon. Hope that Mac flies treating you well. Who we got? Sounding and looking good. Thank you, Kurt. I appreciate you letting me know that. Sometimes you never know if you actually can be heard. Sounded good. Thanks, Mark. Oh, Michael, we got the t big comment here. The 202 is assembled in, or is in the assembly process. Struggle finding time, bad weather, and no instructions. Okay. Well, Michael, you should give me a ring so we can chat about how to assemble the 202 because it is a bit of a beast. The Polini 202 is definitely something I'm considering purchasing for myself next year, and I'm super excited to see more of what you think because Judson will not stop going on and on about how great it is. All right, uh, Mark, what size wing do you like and how much do you weigh? I am actually almost 190 pounds now, about 185 to 188. I've been bulking up a little bit in the muscle department to help re-strengthen up my ankles, which, by the way, are feeling great. I am back to walking, back to walking. If you guys know, I had a crash back in August, and I hurt my ankles. I'll tell you guys a little bit more about that in a second. I got a bunch of things today that I want to talk about. No wingtip dragging allowed, Brian. And, oh, I hear Mike's motorcycle behind me. Mike, our instructor, just swung by to show me his new motorcycle. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, what wing do I like, Mark? Sorry, I didn't get to that. Uh, yeah, I'm 190 pounds. I'm getting, I'm getting bigger over here. I'm working on the muscle. I'm trying to get to 200. I don't think it's gonna happen. I'd, I'd be pretty big to be two, uh, at 200. And I fly an 18. I'm actually thinking of completely switching all of my wings to 20s or 22s. I'm reconsidering how much. I'm reconsidering what size wings to fly. I don't really know what size I want to continue to fly. Historically, I was flying 16s when I weighed about 170, 160 pounds. And I actually switched away from 16s completely last year or this year. And I switched to 18s. And now I'm feeling like 18s are also a little bit on the small side for me, especially at 5,000 feet. And I'm thinking of switching to 20s or even 22s. Also, going up in size is going to make the launches a little bit slower, landings a little bit slower, which I might need with my ankle. I'm not sure what the recovery arc is going to look like. They're saying I should be back to normal-ish by January and fully recovered by August. But Mac Hohen, what's up, dude? What's up? What's up? Uh, you were wanting the toggles. I think I have a set laying in here. No, I don't. They're in my truck. I just got another prototype test. Type? Prototype. We didn't love the original version, so we're working on it. But, yeah, 190 pounds. I am 190 pounds, Mark. I, I weighed in 188 today at the gym. 
I used to weigh about 180, 175, 180. I've been building muscle mass and trying to put on additional muscle mass and strengthen up. So I'm, I'm hanging out a little higher. But yeah, moving on from that, how much weight have I gained? Uh, I, I mean, the skinniest I've ever been is about 160 pounds. Josh McGee, yo, what up? You're Josh. Oh, man, I haven't done a live stream in two months, guys. What's up, Matt? It's good to see you, Matt. Am I going to see you at Salt and Sea this winter? I'm going to be heading down there for all of February and March. Are we going to see you down there, Matt Cohen? Josh, I miss you a lot, Bresky. Uh, I was watching the video Judson made last night of us going to visit you, and I definitely miss that that whole whole trip, dude. That was too much fun. That was too much fun. I want to go back to the East Coast and fly with you a little bit more. Also hope that you are coming out to the West Coast for the Salt and Sea trip, Josh. Matt, sounds like I'm going to see you down there. Josh, am I going to see you at Salt and Sea this year? You're going to have to respond to that one, Josh. Uh, Brian, Brian, great question. Is the crash video coming? Brian, yes. I'm actually on a... I've, I've been spending a lot of time writing up crash reports, reviewing situations, and, in, and not just crashes, but also extreme situations, situations where things didn't go as planned, reviewing and assessing and analyzing pilots' decisions, what led to the outcome. So I've been actually writing a bunch of reports. I've been writing some crash reports. I've been throwing myself into that. I kind of get kind of learned recently I have an obsessive personality. And I've been spending a lot of time on that, and I'm going to be making a video detailing my crash and exactly what happened, what I learned, what led to me doing that, the decisions, and all the things that ultimately came as a consequence of those poor decisions and what we can learn from that. So I might film that video tomorrow. I actually have a bit of a camera set up right now to do just that. There's a big DSLR right there that I might use this weekend for that, or excuse me, this week to film that video. It's long overdue, but I was preoccupied with running a business and training people how to fly a paramotor to make that video. But anyways, Miss, we will see you at Salton, also bringing Miro's son. You will be bringing Miro's son. Will Miro also be joining, or will it just be Miro's son? I look forward to meeting Miro's son, and I hope Miro's there too. Uh, what is up? Let's see. What's up on the hottest in paramotors? Warp 2, Viper XC, Pat, Macfly, all old news. Anything new coming you've noticed? Uh, James, no, I haven't noticed anything new on the horizon. I think we kind of have a lot of the new stuff. A lot of the new stuff came out late last year in terms of wings. The Warp 2, the Freeride 2, Viper XC came out this year. And I'm not sure there's anything really planned for next year that's all that exciting. I'm not I'm not seeing anything in the pipeline or hearing anything that's all that exciting. I mean, we had the mullet this year and we had the mustache last year. Those were kind of cool, new concept. I bet you will see a ozone version of the mullet and mustache for free flying. You might see a mullet slash mustache style wing for paramotoring. I feel like I heard ITV was working on one, but at this point, you're just kind of looking at trade-offs and thinking about what you're going to see. A Drifty 2 would be kind of cool. I, I think a Drifty 2 would be cool. I'd consider getting a Drifty. I really don't know what to wing to get right now. My Viper XC is too small. By the way, if anybody's interested in 18, I'd really have a hard time getting rid of it, but 18 is just too small for me right now. And I don't know what to get for a new wing. And the Drift Air is actually on the table, considering a Drift Air 20 or 22, which is a little bit bigger than what I normally fly. But I'm changing up how I, I think, process, and fly. I don't quite fly the same as I used to ever since my ankle crash back in August. My ankle crash. My wheat field crash, which I never talked about. But I want to kind of upsize wings. I don't think I need to be flying the 18s. I, I can milk 20s and 22s to do the same thing. I'm not a huge maneuvers guy, despite what you might think. I really am not big on maneuvers. I, I'm more big on cross-country stuff and proximity stuff. Uh, let's see. Uh, Drifty Gang, yeah, I might be a new found member of the Drifty Gang. Let's see, well, are you digging the trike? Am I digging the trike? Actually, yeah, I really like the trike. I'm wondering why I'd ever stop flying the trike, to be completely honest with you, Kurt. 
I have additional loading on the wing, so I need a, a bigger size. You definitely notice the drag of the trike, reduced efficiency of the trike is definitely there. But I really love the trike. Like with the trike, dude, you don't have to worry about running. You don't have to worry about, you, you don't, your motor out risk is also different with a trike because if you have to land downwind or you have to land crosswind, it's not nearly as big of a deal. So you can almost take additional motor out risk with a trike in that aspect. You do have to be a little more aware of the surface that you're landing on because you can roll the trike, whereas foot launch, you can land on dunes and run up a hill and down a hill. So you're a little bit more limited in those aspects. But if you have a downwind landing on a trike, it's really not that big of a deal. You just land really, really fast or a crosswind landing. You might roll it if you don't have good glider control skill. You don't practice landing crosswind because there's, uh, there is still energy in that wing. It depends on how much wind you have, but a trike does change things. I, I actually really look forward to flying a trike back in Utah because I can fly and land and touch and go in a lot more places. And to be completely frank, I'm not sure I, I I'm not sure I'll really stop flying the trike. I, I think I'll fly the trike a lot. I'll probably foot launch as well, but I will probably do both. I, I mean, I'll I'll trade back and forth pretty consistently between the trike and foot launch. It's kind of a cool tool. Have I gone off Sky Paragliders now? Yeah, I haven't flown a Sky Paraglider wing in a year. I bought a SEMA Power and a Sky Flux. I enjoyed the wings, but I didn't feel like they were anywhere near the level of, not anywhere near, I, I felt like they were behind in terms of performance and overall, they didn't feel like they were on the same level as other wings from other manufacturers. So it's nothing to do with Sky in specific. I like Sky, I'd be happy to fly more Sky wings, but nothing Sky has right now is competitive or exciting to me. I'm not really interested in any of their wings. Even in the paragliding world, I feel like they're five years behind, four years behind, something like that. They definitely should do a whole revamp of their product lineup and catch up in some sense to what Ozone is doing in the paramotor world, what Dudek is doing in the paramotor world, and what Ozone and Jin are doing in the paragliding world. Those are kind of the leading uh, manufacturers across the board. Uh, let's see what we got. Amber, hopefully in April we'll stop in Utah and see you on your way to Texas to watch the total solar eclipse. Oh, it's been over a year since we've been there. Yeah, it's been a long time since you came down to Utah. It's been a long time since we've seen you guys. It was October of last year, which is crazy to me that it's been a freaking year. I can't wait to see you guys again. Let's see what we got. Any hopes to go to East Coast Flyings 2024? I was planning to go to the Bad Apples Flying, but some things have changed since I was originally planning to go to the Bad Apples Flying. I'm not sure if I'm going to make it out there. I, I It's a long ways for me to drive, so I wouldn't be driving. I'd be flying, and I wouldn't have any gear. And I wouldn't have anywhere to stay, so I'd have to coordinate with someone, and then I'd just be kind of... I, I, I don't know. There's a lot of weird things that go into going to Bad Apples because it's on the other side of the country. I did plan to go to it, but as of right now, I'm not really planning to attend Bad Apples. Let's see. How do you land trikes in hunger res reversible winds without turtling? How do you land the trike? Actually, Matt, landing the trike in high winds is not that difficult, but you do have to be really good at... Let, let, me, let me think about that for one second. Landing a trike... In high winds, landing is not a problem. Losing control of the wing is the problem. Launching in high winds is also not the problem. Losing control of the wing in high winds is the problem. So when you come in and land on a trike in high winds, you come in more power on than you do power off because you need to keep your you need to keep yourself from rolling backwards because the wing is going to want to pull you backwards so you simply apply power until you stop and then if you would like to keep going forward you apply a little bit more power and you move forward and then you just kind of taxi to disable the wing you turn and you just kind of bring one wing tip down until you're facing that wing and then you grab both your d-risers and you disable it to your side and then you either unclip and go get it or have a friend grab it in high wind conditions with a trike solo flying is a little bit more sketchy you definitely want somebody there to be able to help you disable the wing solo launching is not a problem landing rolling a trike is really just about not knowing when you're producing lift and having the wing off access when you do produce lift. So if you're going to roll a trike, you're going to roll a trike because you're producing lift with the wing off access, which pulls you sideways and or you turn and you go against each other just like that. What up, Ty? Good to see you. Um, so it's it's 
It's easy to roll a trike if you don't know when and where and why you would roll a trike. As long as you can keep the wing above you and you do not lose control of the glider, then you will not roll a trike. Also, you can have the wing completely off axis as long as you are not going fast enough to produce enough lift to pull you over. So if you're going really slow, you can have the wing tip on the ground. And it, it, that's dependent on how much wind, of course, you have. If you have a little bit of wind, you'll be going slower. If you have no wind, you'll actually still be going quicker, like 10 miles an hour or so. But if you're approaching on air, your flying speed, if you're approaching on liftoff speed and your wing is off access, that's usually when you roll and or you dump the power and you turn, stuff like that. It's, it's when you and the airfoil are going in opposite directions that you'll roll the trike. And that comes down to... Either you don't know how to steer a trike to where the wing is going and or you overdo corrections and or you lose control of the wing. Let's see. Sorry about that. Uh, drifty versus free ride. Trevor Steele, Drifty versus free ride. Um, let's see. Drifty, Drift Air, Dudek Drift Air versus the Ozone free ride. I'm assuming you mean free ride two. I'm not going to talk about the free ride one as I have no experience really on a free ride one. So Drifty Ozone, or excuse me, Dudek Ozone. Generally speaking, Dudek has a higher reflex profile than ozone does. So you're going to have a more solid feel in turbulence than you are on an ozone wing. That is due to a loading change, pr internal pressure change. This is how ozone and Dudek design their wings. Ozone has more of a light feel that's rooted in paragliding. Dudek has more of a, a really solid feel that's really rooted in... Um, in reflex. It's really rooted in reflex. So when you go through turbulence on those two wings, you're going to feel more comfortable on a Dudek wing than you are going to feel on an ozone wing. So if you're flying in un unconsistent, un uneven, unstable air, you're going to prefer being on the drift air over the free ride. Now, the aspect ratios, I believe, are nearly the same, but generally what I've seen, because ozone has slightly less reflex than the, the Dudek, ozone carries energy a little bit better. So you're going to go a little bit higher in maneuvers on an ozone wing than you are going to on a Dudek wing, especially with that free ride. That free ride's going to take you higher up. As far as roll speed, I would argue that the Drift Air probably rolls harder than the free ride. That might just be because of how they design the tip steer. Ozone's tip steer doesn't seem to be quite as effective as Dudek's tip steer does. So when you go to actually roll the wing, I feel like, and this could be false, I'd have to fly two same size side by side. I feel like you would be able to roll the drift air a little bit harder. As far as inflation and launch, drift air wasn't that difficult. I don't have any experience with it in high winds. But I would argue that the, the, the free ride 2 is going to be easier to launch than that drift air is going to be as soon as long as you know how to inflate that free ride and you know to check it because the free ride 2 does inflate hard and it will overfly you if you're not prepared for it. As far as landing goes, it would be comparable. I think speed wise, the free ride 2 is going to be faster than that drift air. My free ride too, I was able to get like 51, 53 miles an hour, somewhere in there. Drift airs, I've never had a, a, a comparable size to really test, but the things I'm seeing is like 48, 49. So you're going to get a little more speed out of that, that free ride. Overall, if I had to pick one for just pure raw fun, I would probably pick a free ride because I enjoy the energy more than I enjoy the roll speed. If you're more of a roll speed kind of guy, you may go drifty. I also would pick a free ride because I would be looking for something that's only pure raw fun. If this is a one wing kind of thing, I'd probably go drifty because I'd rather have more stability, uh, more reflex in the turbulence and the feel of the drift air over the ozone. Which, by the way, one of the topics I'd love to talk to you guys about, and one thing I will be talking about, is whether reflex it has a net positive or net negative on overall paramotor safety. I've been doing a lot of digging into that and, and, and discussing that and thinking about that, and we could talk about that later. But to answer your question, Duck Split, if it was going to be my second wing and it was going to be just for fun, I'd pick a free ride. If it was going to be my only wing, I'd pick a drift air. And that was a lot of things, a lot of jumbo mumbo to answer your question. Anyways, I, that, that's what I'd say. Uh, yeah, moving on from that, which took me a while, Michael Cordero. Good to, good to see you. I want to see you guys. I think you guys should come down here. 
The beach is nice to be at. It's been a while since you've been here, almost two years, and you totally should come back and visit it. Too bad you weren't able to come down here while we were down here. We will be here until the 18th, or I will be here till the 18th. Um, good and bad about the free ride to Travis. I feel like I just answered a lot of that in what I just said. Travis, if you still want me to talk about the good and bad of the free ride too, please comment and I will happily do so. Otherwise, I feel like I said uh, a bit about that just now. Uh, let's see. Dude, we would love that. Two feet and a heartbeat. Are you talking about me attending the bad apples flying? I'm not 100% sure what you mean. I believe that's Aaron. Upon landing in high winds, it's all about power versus pitch. Not exactly sure what you mean. I'd have to think about that. Power versus pitch. Yeah, now you're going to want to expand on that one a little bit there, champ, champ. Let's see. Just wanted to stop by and say hi. What up, Ty? What up, Ty? I assume you haven't been flying. I wish we were there to help you get some more flying time in. I saw you got the new helmet. I like the helmet. That's good. That's good. Let's see. Let's see. James, props. Do you have any personal experience with off-brand props that are all over Facebook? No, I don't have any experience with off off-brand props. I personally would not run an off-brand prop. If you have an off-brand, cheap, un slightly unbalanced prop, it's going to lead to additional failures on your engine. For me, it's not worth the reduced cost with the possibility of more failures, right? You're increasing your risk of failure. You're increasing your risk of the prop being imbalanced, causing exhaust cracks. You're increasing your risk of the prop being imbalanced, causing additional vibration that leads to something, and you're doing it at the the benefit of a slight savings in cost. I would rather run an E-Prop or a Helix or a Viterazi prop, given that they are really nice props, or a Scout prop. Scout props are really nice props. You're really, the only thing you're giving up for those is additional money, and I would so rather pay a little bit extra to know that I'm running a really nice prop and to not worry about it. It's one less thing to have to worry about. What are your thoughts on the Ozone Kona 2? I'm a new paramotor pilot with about 15 flights under my belt. Love your content. Thank you. I appreciate you loving my content. What do I think about the Kona 2? I think the Kona 2 actually has a really cool spot in the ecosystem and overall first look at paramotor wings because the Kona 2 is a non-reflexed beginner style wing. So it's, it's similar to a Spider 3, but non-reflexed. So the Kona 2 is going to have the benefit of a better glide slope. It's going to have the benefit of being better in ridge soaring conditions. It's going to be better in all things paragliding. It's going to be slightly worse in all things paramotoring because it's lacking that reflex. And what I mean by that is it's going to be slower. It's going to maneuver a little less. It's going to be a little less dynamic, but it's added benefit of an increase in paragliding performance might be of benefit to you depending on where you where you live and what kind of flying you do. Uh, if you encounter mild turbulence, it's going to perform le worse than a reflex counterpart like a Spider 3. But if you encounter really strong turbulence, it might perform better depending on who's piloting the wing. Both should handle strong turbulence similar similarly. It's going to be more prone to collapsing than a reflex counterpart. And reflex counterparts, as far as what I've seen, are recovering and responding nearly identical to classic profiles. They're just more resistant. So there's my little spiel on that. Would I pick a Kona 2? No, I'd probably pick a Spider 3 over a Kona 2 just because the added benefit of reflex is nice. The reflex is going to save you and catch you in a lot of situations that a classic profile is not going to. Moving on from that, 20-meter drift air just hit 44. Nice. Dude, drift airs are sweet. Love me a good drift air. A dealer talked me out of buying a Spider 3 B-Wing. I have 47 flights. I usually fly in straight lines, so his reasons for not selling it to me, not enough flights. Does that make complete sense? James, no. No, it does not make complete sense. Uh, James, I sell Spider 3s to beginner students. That's usually the wing that I recommend for new pilots. I think that the... Spider 3 is a fantastic beginner starter wing. I think its safety is there. I think its performance is scalable, meaning if you are a better pilot and you know what you're doing, you can make that wing do anything you want, meaning you're not going to quickly outgrow it like you will a, a traditional A wing like the Mojo. I think the Spider 3 will grow with you. I think you will enjoy it. I think the ease of use of the Spider 3 should not be undervalued. Having something that's easy to launch, forgiving on launch, easy to land, forgiving on landing is extremely important. Spider 3 has proven itself in turbulence, and Spider 3 has proven it 
itself to be a fun wing. I, I, I'm a big fan of the Spider 3. I think the Dudex Solo is, is a comparable. I'm currently comparing it side by side with the Spider 3. But from what I've seen, the only advantage of the Solo, or, excuse me, there's a couple advantages of the Solo. It has, a, has more reflex to it, which means it's going to be more resistant to collapses, which means you're going to be able to take it up in higher levels of turbulence without active piloting before it collapses. The counter side to that or the downside to that is it's going to be a more dynamic collapse inside of the recollapse. It's also a little bit more in terms of performance from what I've seen is it maneuvers slash rolls a little bit better. It's easier to get it to roll than the Spider 3. So there's my little thoughts on that. You want to go faster thoughts, James? I would actually, I would be, I would be hesitant to just be in a pursuit of speed. I can understand a desire to go at least a certain amount of speed. If you're flying around on a really slow A wing, I can understand why you'd want to go a little bit faster. But the pursuit of just pure raw speed can get you in nasty situations. Uh, a Spider Three is definitely going to be faster than an A wing. Uh, the reflex profile alone is going to be faster. Let alone the fact that it's also a B wing. I would consider getting a Spider 3 or a Solo. Solo is Dudex version of the Spider 3 is how I would argue, or how I would describe it, excuse me. Moving on. Yeah, it's Aaron. Yeah, Bad Apples, I missed it last year because you were at my place. Yeah, I may come out there. I may come out there. Maybe we should uh, talk a little bit and see if we can figure out some logistics or if you know anybody that's got a place for me to stay, a motor, whatever. Uh, I'm open to it. I'm not opposed to going to the Bad Apples flying. Logistically, it is difficult. Uh, logistically, it also eliminates, it takes time of mine away from being able to do other things. So it's an investment of my time, which means I can't run a class during that. I can't run an advanced training or beginner training during that. Uh, I can't go make videos. So it is an investment for me and it's worth it, but I, I, I need to figure the logistics out. I need to weigh the pros and cons to it. My buddy went from a Kona 2 to a Luna 2. He will never go back. I don't blame him. I don't blame him. The Luna 2 is a completely different level than the Kona 2. The Kona 2 is a very beginner wing. I would argue that the Kona 2 is a more beginner wing than a Spider 3, and the Spider 3 and, and Luna 2 are in very different categories. Luna 2 is another level of performance, and yeah, I would can't imagine somebody going from a Luna 2 to a Kona 2. I would highly recommend against it. Unless you're looking for a second wing for your, your bumpy conditions, more extreme conditions. Michael, I love my Spider 3. Super easy to operate. It's super fun, too. I, Spider 3s are fantastic, man. I love a Spider 3. Thoughts on SkyMax Pulse Air? Big enough for a 140 prop. Any other frame that breaks down and can travel well? Yeah. The best frame for breaking down and traveling by far is the PAP Triox. Or, excuse me. Tynox? I don't know how to say it. The PAP T-I-N-O-X is the best for breaking down and traveling by far from what I've seen. I haven't spent a lot of time with the SkyMax, so I, I can't speak too much on that. But the PAP in a matter of 56 seconds can be completely disassembled, excluding the prop, and in a matter of a minute and six seconds can be assembled. So in two minutes, you can take it apart and put it together, which is really, really hard to beat. Now, it doesn't pack down as small as I imagine the SkyMax does because it does have individual cage sections, but it does come with a travel case that you can stick all the cage sections into and store. If you are somebody who has to take apart your paramotor every single time, the PAP is phenomenal for that. I think it's it's probably the best. The MacFly, my favorite, is about three to four minutes to dissemble. It definitely takes longer. It's not something you want to take apart every time. A Parajet is about the same. It's about five minutes pointing because there's a MacFly right there and a, a Parajet right there. The Parajet is about five minutes. I also really love the Parajet. Both great options, but if you're having to take apart the paramotor every time, the PAP is by far the best. Let's see. James, your instructor pro sucks probably. I can't speak for that, but if, it, but I, I, I'm sure. One thing I would like to point out is most paramotor instructors are really not that great, and I don't want to point fingers or point names, and it's not because they're not great people, but because they their training is not necessarily the best, and there's a lot of really subpar training out there. There's a lot of really subpar instructors out there. There are also a lot of really great instructors out there. There's also really a lot. There's quite a few really great schools. There's always going to be great ones. There's always going to be sucky ones. 
Let's see. So is the spider a B or a C? C conflicting info. There's no conflicting info on that. From what I've seen, I'd love to see where you're seeing the conflicting info. The spider is an E and B rated wing, I believe. If not the spider, the roadster, which is a comparable, but with thicker material. So let's look it up. Ozone spider three, and it's only thicker material on the leading edge. I believe the spider three may not be, <coughs> I believe the roadster was the one that was certified ENB. I'm not sure if the spider was certified ENB. It doesn't appear that the Spider was certified ENB, but the Roadster 3 was certified ENB. The only difference between the Roadster and the Spider is the top surface cloth. The top surface cloth on the Spider is a super weight, lightweight material, whereas the Roadster, I'm looking at it right now, is a more thick, more rigid material. Not by a lot, but by a little bit. So there's a pro and a con to the difference in the material. Lighter weight material is gonna inflate easier. It's not gonna last as long. It's also gonna maneuver a little bit easier. So you'll have a little bit more flickability to a lighter weight wing versus a, a heavier wing. You will have a more bouncy feel, I would say, in turbulence as well on a lightweight material wing over a heavyweight material wing. So in, in the same kind of style that you could say an airplane that weighs a thousand pounds more will get rocked around less in turbulence. So the heavier your, your wing is, the, the, more, uh, the less it will bounce around in the turbulence. So uh, anyways, not to go on a tangent, the Spider 3, it is a comparable or it is an identical wing to the to the Roadster 3, just with different fabric, which does change things, but not by a lot. And the Roadster 3 was an ENB. That would mean the Spider 3 is most likely an ENB. Long story short, my instructor sold me a Kona 2 because I was overloaded on my 26 Spider 3. I weigh 230 with a pair of Jet Maverick. Uh, 27 Kona versus a 26 Spider. How heavily, how, how much more overloaded were you? Like, like, like walk me through the numbers here. You're, you, you weigh 230 with the Parajet Maverick. Is that your all up weight or are you 230 add the Parajet Maverick, Hunter? I, I would like a little bit of explanation there because I doubt that you are overloaded on that Spider 3 to the point where you should have made a switch. You have a zero experience, but I have noticed my Spider 3 is a lot faster and seems to oscillate easier than your Kona. Yeah, a more overloaded wing is more likely to oscillate. It is also more likely to be faster. Uh, but 230 on a 26 would be overloaded, but 230 with your paramotor on a 26 would not be overloaded. But if you're overloaded on a 26 by 3, you very close to overloaded on a 27 Kona 2. Moving forward with the mustache, would with the mustache be the best PPG, PG wing to do both? No, the mustache is definitely not the best. I feel super safe on your spider. You should. Offer advanced training at Bad Apples or similar. I or I heard you're looking to give instructor courses. There's a perfect spot to give me an instructor ground course. I actually cannot give instructor courses because I didn't receive my instructor administrator rating through the USPPA because in order to receive that, you have to have a minimum of two years of instruction in the USPPA. I don't have that. I won't have that until May. Come May this coming year, I can apply for it and receive it because I will have been instructing in the USPPA for two years. But I haven't been instructing in the USPPA for two years, and for that, they declined me. Think of it as a marketing trip for company exposure. Oh, James, the Bad Apple's Fly needs no sales pitch for me. It is a way to build relationships, shake hands, meet people, sell equipment. Absolutely a marketing trip, absolutely a sales trip. It would be a write-off from a business standpoint. I would totally go to it. It's, it's just a question of opportunity cost of the time to go to it versus something else. And it's also the cost to go to it. Uh, I would like to be a part of an instructor course. I've done some instruction. I helped a few beginner classes. Maybe I can get hired up at a coming paramotor school someday. Nice, nice. I currently can't offer an instructor course. But in the future, that's a possibility. I'm 230 myself with boots. And I is, wait, 230 yourself with boots. And that's not including the motor and fuel. Okay, so 230 plus 90. 90 is about the average for reserve and the motor. And your wing, because you also have to calculate in the weight of the wing. So take 230 you know, add 90, that's what, 320, 320 divided by 2.2 .2 is 145, 145 on a spider 3, 26 is barely overloaded, I probably wouldn't have had you switch, I probably would have let you stay, I will overload a wing 5 to 10 kgs over, now that is also dependent on what altitude you live at, so what altitude do you live at, Hunter, because if you're at 5,000 feet, I definitely would have upsized you, but I would have 
upsized you to a Kona. I would have upsized you to a larger spider. If you're at sea level, I probably wouldn't have upsized you. Because, yeah, you're slightly overloaded, but you're 650 feet. I, I don't think I would have changed you wings. Uh, Might have been an excuse to sell you another glider. I wouldn't have done that if you had come to me. I would have had you continue to fly your 26 Spider 3. I would just would have had a conversation around what the difference is between being slightly overloaded and not overloaded is, which really... 5 kgs over, which is what, 5, 10, 12 pounds, is not a lot. It's not a lot. Fill your gas tank up with a little less gas. And you're, you're good to go. I, I wouldn't stress or overreact about being 5, five pounds, or uh, excuse me, yeah, 5 kgs over. I prefer kiting my Spider for sure, and I hate all the unsheathed lines on the Kona. Yeah, I, I wouldn't fly the Kona. I'd go back to your 26 Spider 3. I'd recommend you sell your Kona and continue to fly your Spider 3. How many hours do you have, Hunter? You know, tell me a little bit more about your experience level, skill set, how long you've been flying. That'll give me a better perspective as to kind of what you're looking at. I sure enjoyed your advanced training, although I was the new guy. Such a great training, Trevor. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate that. I, I, I enjoyed having you out here, Mark. I'm glad to see the, the improvements we made on your skill. I'm, I'm very grateful to have been able to spend that time with you. I appreciate you spending that time with me, and I can't wait to spend more time with you, Mark. Uh, I would do the spider. Spider is a better option between the two. I'd be willing to pay for this kind of consult consultation as well. I hate bombarding with my own issues. No, you're good. This is usually what happens with live streams. Is you end up going in a lot of different directions. And if you're having this problem, think about how many other people might be having an identical problem, which is definitely a thing. Uh, by the way, I broke my chair right before this live stream started. Uh, I'm... I'm having a great time over here, guys. I am currently in Corpus Christi, Texas. It's where I've been for the winter time so far. And I will be headed to Florida for January and then back to Salton Sea for February and March. 40 to 50 hours kiting and two hours airborne. Two hours airborne is light. Who was your instructor? Trevor is humble and loves helping all of us. True team player. I appreciate that. I'm sure plenty of people would say I'm not humble, but I try my best. <laughs> I try my best. Um... Fantastic, fantastic. Uh, okay, guys, let's see. Hey, so there was about 20 topics. Hunter, you keep giving me a little bit more information. I'll keep telling you. But there were a lot of topics that I'd love to talk to you guys about. Ooh, take Ozones and Dudex out of the picture. New mate. Ho, ho, that's actually a good question, James. That's actually a good question. Need to swing by North Alabama between Texas and Florida. I might be stopping in South Carolina on my way to Florida, but it's looking like time's a little less abundant in that time frame because I am in Utah a little longer due to airfare costs. So I might not have the free time that I was hoping to have to make my way up to South Carolina, and as a result, I also wouldn't be able to stop by North Alabama, but if I can, you bet you I will. Okay, let's see. Ozone and Dudex out of the picture, new favorite wing manufacturer and model. I'd honestly have to go with ITV. If you took... Mm, take that sentence back right now. ITV would be number two. Gin would be number one. If, if you eliminated Ozone and Dudek from the paramotor wing world, Gin would probably take the cake for me. They're, I, I don't know much about their beginner wings, so I'd have to do a little digging. I would be willing to use the Baja, although it's not my favorite, which is why I don't use it now. However, Jin's intermediate wing, which is the Falcon 2, is absolutely phenomenal. Jin's advanced wing, which is the Carve 2, is absolutely phenomenal. And I think the Jin Carve 2 is probably the most playful and roll-happy and energetic wing you can buy now. I wouldn't buy any other wing for pure raw fun. That would be my number one choice. I'd say a free ride would be number two. Uh, mm, an AWOC might be number three. A Drift Air might be number four. Like, just for pure raw play, those are those maybe not in that exact order. But those are kind of the big, fun play wings. I wouldn't buy a Snake 3. But I, I love what Gin does. I like the Gin sauce. I like their secret ingredients they stick in there. I'm, I'm a big fan. I, ITV has some good products as well. I, I feel like ITV is kind of half-finished. I'm never, like, super satisfied with ITV, but I'm never disappointed. You know, the AWOC 3 was cool. It blew up on you if you trimmed out and pulled brakes, which is uh, characteristics of classic profiles and reflex profiles. The AWOC 3 was a classic profile, not a reflex profile. I actually had a big collapse uh, about 30, 50 feet off of the ground on that AWOC. 
The Piper is great, highly reflexed wing, although its launching characteristics and landing characteristics weren't my favorite. It also was altitude hungry, but it rolled and it was it was stable. The Baja was 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 good. I wouldn't say the Baja was great. I never really really loved it. It was fast, but it, it, it like had a weird dance to it and it kind of had a weird feel to it. I did get hit with a gust front on the Baja. I, I would trust the Baja in some nasty turbulence, although I did watch collapse on the Baja and it is it actually handled just like most wings handle a collapse, which we could talk extensively about collapses as I wrote a 4,000 page, 4,000 word paper a couple days ago about it. Oh, hello. Um, 4,000 word paper about collapses, the theory of collapses, the differences of, and what makes, what, what are the th things that affect how a wing handles collapses, responds to collapses, the characteristics inside a collapse. Anyways, moving on from that, there was your answer to that question. Let's see. Ozone's and Dudex out of the picture. There's your answer. This is usually how I go. I just ramble in a bunch of different directions. How about trims on a Spider 3? Pulling down okay, same as normal. Up for reflex, right? Can't wait for yours. Uh, Mark, give me a call. I'll give you a little more detail about the, the trims on a Spider 3. But you can use brakes at any point on the trims on the Spider 3. Don't worry about this reflex thing. Reflex will only... The, the way we think of reflex is the point in which you can no longer pull brakes. That point is when you apply speed bar. That point is at no, nowhere in the trims. You can trim down, you can trim out. You trim down, you're going to go slower, glide better. You trim out, you're going to go faster, be a little more touchy. But trims neutral is the red line. It's in the middle. Stick it there, leave it there. Don't change it. You won't need to change it for the style of flying you have, Mark. Why do you insulate the garage doors in Corpus Christi? Well, it gets really hot in the summertime. This room that I'm in is actually a gym. If I turn the camera around, there's gym equipment and a workout bar and a bunch of other things. And so in the summertime, when they're training in here, they like to turn the, the close the garage, turn the fan on, and turn an AC unit on to make it nice and cool in here. And that's why the garage doors are insulated. There's also reinforcement because... Corpus Christi gets hurricanes, which I found out. So they reinforce the garage door for that. What's the smallest carve they make? Uh, Duck Spit PPG. I believe they only make an 18. They might be willing to make you a 16. With their carve one, they only advertised the smallest being an 18, but would make 16s upon request. So you might be able to get a 16. I'm unsure on that. I haven't pursued it. I know Judson would like a 16 but it's not something that we have put a lot of time into figuring out or asking. I'd hit up Chris Santa Croce at Superfly and see if he has any information on that. I wouldn't be surprised if they make a 16. I don't think they will make anything smaller than a 16, like a 14. Although if they did make a 14, it would be great. Moving on, I felt like my instruction, my first, I fell, I left instruction at my first flight lesson because my own anxiety issues, honestly. My instructor, Bill Stoll, is great. We just didn't really get along. Hey, getting along with your instructor is an extremely important part. If you didn't get along with your instructor, that's that's a big deal. You want to be with somebody that you get along with. You want to be training with somebody that you like, that you respect, that you understand, that understands you, that can effectively communicate and articulate the information that needs to be passed on. You need an instructor that's responsive. You need an instructor that is able to help you. If you didn't get along with your instructor, that is no, no nothing bad to say necessarily about the instructor. It just wasn't a great relationship. So I, I can understand that, Hunter. Hunter, I would love to have you come out to one of our progression trainings, either at Salton Sea or in Utah or whenever. I would love to come have you have you come out and spend some time with us. Is there a tandem trike you can put a foot launch motor on? Yes, there actually is a tandem trike you can put the foot launch motor on. That tandem trike is MacFly's tandem trike. The MacFly paramotor can attach directly to the MacFly's tandem trike. You would actually take the MacFly paramotor just sitting right there. You'd remove the swing arms. You then would lift it up and bolt it onto the trike, and it attaches in a couple different places. And then you can do tandems with a MacFly paramotor and the MacFly paramotor tandem trike, which I want to say is around 4500 bucks. I could be wrong on that. But the, the kicker with that is you would need really a big engine to be doing trike tandems like a Polini 202, 303, or Cosmos. And you're not really going to, well, you might want to foot launch a 202. I'd foot launch a 202. A lot of people are, are switching to foot launching 202s. But if you're running a Moster, you may not have enough power for that. Let's see. 
I so I made a dumb decision and have my have been flying on my own since. I wouldn't say flying on your own is a super dumb decision. It is not the smartest decision, but it's not necessarily a stupid decision. I take that back. I take that back. I don't think flying on your own without any instruction on your first handful of flights is smart. It's it's actually quite illogical to fly on your own. I wouldn't say it's illogical. It's it's quite dangerous to fly on your own without any level of instruction or supervision. There's just a lot of things that you don't know that you can figure out, and some people can safely do it. A lot of people can probably safely do it, but your learning curve is sharper. Your risk is, is much higher. You're, you're increasing your risk. You're increasing the time it takes you to learn the skills. You're decreasing the amount of fun you could have because you're increasing the struggle. I personally wouldn't self-train. I would get training. I also would strongly encourage that you get instruction about things beyond just the flying aspect. You strongly get instruction around the risk points and the places that you can get yourself hurt and the places that you can screw things up and the weather and the airspace and, and, and all of those things. I would strongly encourage you to get instruction because those things you will either learn from others, experience, or you will have to experience yourself. There's my little spiel. That's all I got. Let's see. So I'm poor. All extra money goes to paying off the house. 16 meter, I believe. I'm stepping into a conversation I don't understand, so I'm just going to move past that. Thoughts on the new Fortnite season? I do not play video games. Mike eats poop. <laughs> what a name you got there, champ, champ. I don't play video games, so I don't know anything about that. Do you anticipate a Spider 4 anytime soon? Do I anticipate a Spider 4 anytime soon? I haven't heard anything about it. I think a Spider 4 would be cool. I think a Spider XC would be even cooler. I think a Sirocco XC would be even cooler. I think if they made a Spider XC, which was a Spider 3 with winglets, I would be really excited about that. And I probably would sell that more than I'd sell a Spider 3. I'd probably recommend that over a Spider 3 because realistically speaking, people that are buying Spider 3s, majority of pilots are more so just the cross country, go explore kind of guys. And they're the ones that are going to benefit most from a XC style wing, which is, is really just the winglets. And those pilots would be really happy to have that product. And I think Ozone would be smart to make that product and offer that. And I may or may not make that suggestion to them. I also think a Sirocco 3 XC would be cool or a Sirocco 4 XC. I think all of those would be super cool. Just like they did with the Viper XC, they should do that with the Sp Spider 3 and Sirocco 3. Although, it probably will do the same thing to the, to the let's just call it Spider 3. It probably do the same thing to the Spider 3 and the Sirocco 3 that the Viper XC did to the Viper 5, which is nobody bought Viper 5s because you just buy a Viper XC. I had six months of great instruction, just none in the air flying other than towing so my complete so not completely self-trained that's good to hear that's good to hear you know one thing that I, I i do want to talk about that's been on my mind a lot guys is the value of reviewing analyzing and debriefing your videos flights launches landings in air decision making all of those things that's super important and I don't think we value that as a community enough i don't think enough people put an emphasis on that I you also film my flights. That's good. So see, you should film your flights, Hunter, and you should send that to your instructor or to someone like myself or someone who's willing to review it because you need to have somebody that can point out a bunch of things. You need to have that environment where you sit and you analyze your performance, review it, and look for improvements. I actually do that a lot now. And one thing that you guys will see, sorry, get a little close here. I just made a video a couple of days ago about cameras. All right, so this is my Insta360 camera. I think it's super important that you film your flights. I think it's super important that you analyze your flights, either yourself or that you have somebody else also analyze your flights because you're going to learn a lot about things when you do so. I've been reading some books recently about fl fighter jet training, and one of the biggest things that they do there is a lot of intense debriefs about their flights. Every single time, up to seven hours, they will debrief their flights. Whereas us, we will go fly and we don't think anything of it, even if it was good. Even if we had a great flight, great launch, great landing, we won't review it. 
And I think that's I, I think that's just a bad general habit. I think a good general habit would be reviewing everything good and bad and ugly. Another thing that would also be valuable and taking notes and creating a folder of notes that you have learned from these flights. I've started to do this. And as an example, one of the things that I noticed that I do a lot because I was filming with my 360 camera, which is, is my Insta360, one of the things that I noticed I do a lot is I look to my left and when I land and I'm kiting, I look left. And as a result, my left hand actually drops, my right hand raises, and I bring the wing down to the left. And I kite the wing to the left because it's what I'm looking at. And so on the trike, what was happening is I was taking off slightly off axis because I kept bringing the wing down to the left because that's where I was looking. And I noticed that because I looked at the 360 cam footage selfie cam. So I made that shift. I made a change. I, I, I consciously thought about that and changed that in future flights and made improvements to where I was no longer taking off off axis because of that. That's something I have probably been doing for years because I always look left. And how many years have I been building that habit? How many years have I been doing that? How many years have I been taking off slightly off axis and not noticed because I wasn't using a trike? That's a habit that I, I, I did manage to, to change, but how many more do I have that I don't even know I have? So I think it's super important that you analyze your flights. I think it's super important that you film your flights. Yes, I would recommend an Insta360. The video I have about which camera you should buy, GoPro or 360, is, well, you're going to see it's the 360 because I have both. The Insta360 is by far the best camera you can get for filming your paramotor flights. This right here should be viewed as a paramotor black box. You should just push this into the price of getting into paramotoring because it should film your every every minute of your every experience flight because it will tell you everything if something happens if something goes wrong if something goes right if something unexpected happens if you take a tip collapse during a wing over you didn't even know you did guess what the 360 camera is going to catch it i think it's super important that you have a 360 camera i think it's super important that that camera films every single flight i would strap it to your swing arm and leave it in but hit record because it's going to capture it and then in the air push it out this is going to show you everything this is going to show you your, your bad launches, your bad, good launches, your bad techniques, your good techniques. Another thing you can do, another thing you should do, Hunter, is you should take the 360 camera, hit record, stick it in your field, and then not worry about it. And you just go take off, you come in and you land. That 360 camera is going to get your launches, it's going to get your landings without you having to worry about where you are. So what I do during a training class now is I stick the 360 camera in the field and then I just worry about teaching and the 360 camera gets every single person's launches and landings. It gets also all of their flights. So we had a motor out at our last class. Excuse me. We had a motor out at our last class and we caught it on the 360 camera. I had it actually extended on the roof of a trailer and it caught the pilot gliding in and landing. The 360 camera will catch everything it will show you everything and it'll give you the opportunity to analyze and make improvements that you otherwise would not make if you do not have a 360 camera or you do and you don't use it i would highly encourage that you start using this to film every single one of your flights and the, there there is one thing that that you should be aware of and i think if you use it every single time and it's more viewed as your paramotor black box and less viewed as your less viewed as a, a filming device, you won't change the way you fly. Sometimes when you start filming things, you change the way you fly. You pull a little harder, you move a little faster, you do a little more risk, you take a little more risk, your risk tolerance changes, your risk exposure changes because you're filming and you want it to look cool. So don't view this as that thing that you're using to film the cool shot. Don't use this as that thing that you're gonna use to show off to your buddies. This is your black box of paramotoring. Black box in general aviation is the thing that records all of the instruments and audios inside the cockpit so that people can analyze, review it afterwards, and figure out what happened. This is that. This will record everything. This will get everything. No matter what happens, you will get the shot, and you will be able to look back on it and analyze. Others are able to look back on it and analyze with you. This should be with you all the time. So on paramotors like a Mac fly, it's easy to strap to your swing arm. You can actually attach it to the acro arm part and zip tie it too. I would recommend you attach something to do, dampen the vibration. So wrap it in something and then zip tie it too. Leave that there. It should always come with you. On a, on a Parajet, it's a little harder, but you can still get it to the swing arms. Most paramotors, you will be able to get it to the swing arms. You need to make sure that you pay attention to where it is placed because you don't want it placed in a spot that it will catch stuff easily. 
right on your swing arms pulled all the way in is a good spot that won't catch things. If you extend it out, it's now very catchable, but if you leave it in, it's not catchable. There is another spot you can stick it, which is like right up here on your paramotor. People can stick it like right here over the ear. Sky Hiker Mike, I think this is what you do. This is good. However, you can catch that on stuff in a reverse launch if you're really sloppy. It, it's unlikely that you're going to catch it on stuff. It's, it's not a bad spot to put it. You can also strap to the top of your cage, depending on the cage that you have. Like you could strap to the top of a Parajet Maverick cage, but you will catch that if you're reverse launching. You won't catch that if you're forward launching. It's possible, but it's super unlikely. You can stick it sideways on the swing arms, or excuse me, on the cage going outward, but that's definitely a catching snagging hazard on inflation. So there's possibilities. A bunch of different places to put it. You can put it on your helmet, but because of the size, it's likely that you're going to snag it on stuff unless you tuck it down and then move it forward in flight. Uh, it may, it's in many ways, but I do prefer carabiners so I can't drop it. Yeah, you should, you should definitely make sure that you have a, a tethering system to it so that it doesn't fall, but I would attach it somewhere where you are more likely to use it. Anyways, there's my little spiel about why you should always analyze flights. One thing, I'll tell you guys this as well. One thing that we've started doing a lot more that I'm going to start doing more with our ground school, which I'm, com I'm not completely redoing, but I'm revamping to add in a couple of things, which I'll tell you about. The first thing is a lot more flight debriefing, a lot more debriefing of not only your kiting, but your flying, your good, your bad, your in-flight decisions, analyzing a lot of stuff. We are visual creatures. We like pictures. We like videos. We like real world situations. We like stories and we like to see ourselves. So you need to lean into those things when it comes to teaching people. If your ground school and the things you're trying to teach are simply theories slash conversations slash points that you're trying to get them to memorize, they're not going to remember it nearly as well as if you're telling a story which involves the lessons where they can easily remember the story and the lessons that are tied to the story. To add to that, people are visual creatures. The more that you can show them of them, good, bad, and ugly, the more you can show them what it's supposed to look like, good, bad, and ugly, the more you can analyze things on the good and bad side, the more people are going to retain, remember, and learn from that experience. Sorry, I think there's a police chase going on outside. Anyways, how exciting. Anyway, so, so what we are adding to our ground school is a lot more emphasis on reviewing stuff, a lot more emphasis on filming things, reviewing things. I am going to be filming and creating a lot of ground school videos that are showing uh, topics and conversations and things that I find important in a video form. I'm also going to be in really amping up my photo, visual, things like that because that's really, really important. So I'm adding... Uh, a lot of things that are going to do a lot more visual things to our ground school modules, a lot more visual things to our ground school, a lot more reviewing, a lot more emphasis on those things. I'm also creating more checklists and cross check lists. Uh, I want people to, uh, ex especially with things like weather, I want there to be things that eliminate human error and probability because there really is something going on out there, guys. Anyways. I want to eliminate the possibility of humor and error and overlooking a, a critical step. And in order to do that, you have to have a list. You have to have a checklist. So when it comes to checking weather, recently I had a guy who found himself in nasty situations. Not because he didn't check the weather. No, he did. However, there was a few things that were really important that he overlooked. And the overlooking of those few important things ultimately led to him in finding himself in a nasty situation, which he didn't want to be in. And it was completely avoidable. The only way to get around that is either better memorization to check the list and or a actual written down list. I would be shocked if I'm getting swatted. It went away. I thought I heard a dirt bike or like a four-wheeler to go on in a different direction and then our ground school topic and then I'll get back. I thought I heard like a four-wheeler blast down the street and then like uh, 30 seconds later I hear all these cop cars. I still hear them. They're over there. really getting spicy out there can you guys hear it i hear the dirt bike. i hear the four-wheeler right there madness all right okay all right okay i'll i'll, I'll see if i can figure something out I might, I might have bad service here's the here's the parajet that i was talking about here's the mac fly it's currently taken apart 
Oh, yeah, and then, then here's the gym equipment that I was talking about. Let's see. Hey. 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 All right, guys. I got 40 of you. We're coming to investigate. Live stream. Haven't done this before. Show chat. Oh, there we go. I don't know, man. I, I hear, like, several several cop cars, but I, I'm, not, I'm not sure we're getting squatted. So we, we can start making our way back. There's definitely a lot of them out there. I, they're going away. But there's still, like, seven of them. I, I don't know what to tell you guys. I, I feel a little sketchy. I'm going to go hide. Just kidding. Do you guys hear all the cop cars out Missy, you're okay, baby. All right, I'm gonna go to the to the den. <laughs> that was uh, that was Ray. He's the guy whose house I'm staying at. This is his place. This is his sweet motorcycle that he's got right here. And this no, this is not his pink paramotor, and that's not his MacFly. But that is a sweet MacFly right there. I will tell you that. So that was exciting. And no, I didn't quite figure out what it was. Let me see if I can pull up the news station and uh, see if they have anything to say about it. Holy cow, my chair is slowly breaking, guys. I really need to upgrade my chair action here. Uh, Corpus Christi News. Nothing within the last three hours. So I'm not sure we're going to figure out what that was, but I will try and investigate after this and, and see what I can figure out for you guys. You do hear the sirens, though, right? Maybe it's Mike. Mike is our instructor. He's probably off night flying right now, and the FBI caught wind of it. Not the FBI. The FAA caught wind of it, and they're all out there trying to find him. I, I swear that's what it's probably going to be, isn't it? But anyways, there was the, the peak excitement for the night for you guys. I don't. I, I think we were talking about ground school and the, the changes that should be made across the ground school. Totally different topic from what we just did. Um they're still there, but I, maybe they're responding to a, a domestic uh, situation or maybe somebody got hurt and they're there to help them. I, I have no idea, but that did definitely get exciting. Open the garage. Could open the garage for you guys, but... Um, okay, moving on from that. Moving on from that, guys. Don't get busted, you look sketch. Oh, you know what, I'll, I'll tell you this. I have been growing my hair out, if you guys have noticed. I, people say that I've been getting the Judson starter pack. What do you guys think of that? What do you think of the hair? It's a whole lot longer than it's ever been. That's all I'll say about that. Long hair, new look, whatever you wanna, whatever you wanna say about it. Um, but how long am I in Corpus? I am in Corpus until January 4th, I think is the day that I plan to leave. January 3rd, January 4th, I'll be leaving Corpus and I won't be returning uh, anytime soon. I don't have any plans to return. That's when I'll be going to Florida down in where Chucky is. That was me that said Judson starter pack, was it? It's stuck, dude. It's stuck. You said it, and it definitely stuck. You said trim the sides, grow out the top. Well, then I'll be having a full-on mullet. I like. I got wings right here, you know? It's it's weird. I don't, I don't know what to tell you. I've just been growing my hair because I don't like how it is short. I don't know what I think of long, but that's not paramotor related. All right. Back on topic. So, yeah. <laughs> Might need to, to meet you in Florida with Chucky. That would be awesome. Yeah, well, I'll be down there in Florida for probably three weeks with Chucky Wright teaching a couple of his friends. It's the only reason why I'm going out there. I'm not sure when I'm going to get going to leave exactly. I want to be to Salton Sea by February 1st, 2nd, or 3rd for no particular reason other than I want to be there. And I want to fly with my friends. Uh, I will be at the Salton Sea flying probably. I don't really know if I want to fly. I don't really know what the vibe is right now. So I may be floating around for a day or two. I may be off in the... The woods kind of hiding, the woods, the, the hills hiding and camping with my buddy Mike because Salt and Sea is my time to escape from work and go play and fly. So I'm kind of looking forward to that. You can set up a call or something. Uh, shoot me a message on Facebook and uh, we can chat sometime. I'm pretty easy to get a hold of. My phone number is also in the description of my video if you would like to contact me via text or call. I am very fast at responding if it's an urgent message. 
Okay, right. So the ground school. Hey, one thing I think the industry is also in need of is an improved ground school module. There's a lot of people that do a lot of really dumb things that don't even know they do dumb things. And I, I think we as a community should really bond together to help improve that, change that, because there's there's uh, there's just a lot of people making really poor decisions and choices that are unaware of the risk that they're taking and really need to to be aware of that. There needs to be more of a conversation around that. But that kind of wraps up my ground school conversation. And to be honest with you, that kind of wraps up this live stream. I'm probably going to wrap it up here to go figure out what happened and um, eat dinner because I haven't had food yet. Any last questions before I let you guys go? Any last questions? Let's see. Agreed. And I'm sure that you, I'm sure I'm in your list, but I don't do know. You're in the list, but you do know. What do you mean? Oh, you mean a list of people that do dumb things that don't realize they're doing dumb things? Because that's a big list, dude. Like, like I see a lot of pilots out there making really bad decisions, making really poor choices, taking really high risk, and they're not aware of the high risk points that they're taking. And there's a lot that they could do to reduce that risk, and they really should reduce that risk because... I'm surprised there's not more people getting hurt. And to be honest with you, I think the reason that less people are getting hurt is because of reflex profiles. I, I, I think that reflex really saves a lot of people. I, I know I posed a question earlier in this live stream, and that question was, is reflex a net positive or a net negative? What do you guys think? Do you think reflex is a net positive in the paramotor community in terms of overall safety, or do you think it's a net negative in the paramotor community and overall in safety? I think it's a strong net positive in paramotor safety. I think it has had a big, big effect and has increased overall safety for paramotor pilots. Uh, what do you guys think about that idea, that concept? And let's see what you said, Mike. Pushing limits, but I'm still aware. Skill matches risk. Be aware of outs. Motor out risk, weather risk, rotor risk, those are all really big risk points. Pushing limits and, and doing big maneuvers, that's also a big risk point. I would argue those are your two biggest risk points. Motor out is probably number one. That's uncontrolled, out of your control. Number two, excluding how you fly, where you fly. Number two, uh, number two is the pushing of low acrobatic maneuvers. That is diving around low to the ground and miscalculating your dive. Those are probably the two largest points of risk for paramotor pilots. And we could analyze each of those a little bit further. I think motor out risk is something that's often overlooked. There's a lot of situations that people take really, 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 really big risk. Risk that I would argue is if the motor out happened to, to die right there, you might not make it. And they don't realize that. And it's easy to just reduce that risk exponentially. People take huge motor at risk. If people will do a big dive right past a crowd of people or, or their buddies or their truck or their trailer. And it's like, dude, if your motor died at the worst time, which is probably when it's going to die, you are going to go diving right into the side of your trailer. Don't know if you're going to make it from that one. That might be a fatality. That is huge risk that you don't need to take because if you simply added five more feet of altitude or shifted five feet to the side, you wouldn't have that situation. You agree so much with what I'm saying. Yes. So, so many people take this motor at risk and I don't think they realize how much motor at risk they're taking. Like that, that's, that's the scary thing. If you realize and understand and accept the risk, that's one thing. If you don't fully understand the motor at risk that you're taking, that's another thing. So one drill slash exercise that I do very regularly is I'll be flying around. I'll just instantly dump my power and I'll be like, can I land this? Not only can I land this, how am I going to land this? How safe am I going to land this? If I'm not landing this, what is the outcome? You would be really surprised if you did that 15, 20 times in your flight at the absolute worst times, how much risk you're taking. That is a, a, a sure, telltale sign of, of telling you like, oh, the worst case situation, this is what's going to happen. Can you change that worst case situation? Yes, you can. You can alter the way you fly. You can change where you're flying and ultimately remove that risk. Like example, Flying low down wind, okay? Let's say you're in 15 mile an hour winds, you're foot launching. And you, well, wingtip drags is a maneuver. We'll, we'll get to that. Let's say you're flying in 15 mile an hour winds, you turn downwind at 10 feet, your motor dies in the turn. You are going to have to land downwind. Now, let's say you have smooth, a smooth surface to land on. Okay, you can slide it in on your butt. Let's say instead of a smooth surface that you're having to land into the side of a hill. Good luck. 
That's really, really bad. Okay, so how do you reduce that risk? You add 20 feet of altitude. Now you reduce that risk because now you can complete the turn all the way back around to the wind. That's the conversation I like to have is, hey, how can we reduce this risk without really reducing or inconveniencing ourselves as much as possible? Well, with the motor outs, uh, with flying downwind, it's just simply about adding a little bit more altitude. And so now let's, let's look at other situations. Let's say you like to play low and dive around. It just randomly kill your motor during the dives. Randomly kill your, mo not kill it, uh, excuse me, go to idle. Randomly kill the, go, and go to idle right here and see if you can make it. You'll realize that the bank angles that we are going to and going really, really high is really, really high risk if you have a motor out. But if you brought the bank angle from past right here, past horizontal to just below horizontal, your risk actually goes down exponentially. This is something I've recently figured out because I was playing with this. If you actually take the, the, the dives, let's say you're diving back and forth, you take them above horizontal, now, if you have a motor out, the chances of your arc flattening before you hit the ground is less than by a huge margin than if you stop right below horizontal. You are able to so, so – your, your recovery arc is a lot shorter if you stop right below horizontal than if you go above horizontal. The small difference in fun is a huge difference in risk. Right, So if, if you're diving back and forth down a field and you're going past horizontal, you're going way up past flat, right? You're up here. You're above the wingtip. You're at huge risk. The amount of fun between doing that and doing this is not that much more. So this is the conversation that I like to have about, about risk. <clears throat> and a lot of paramotor type pilots take a lot of freaking risk. And it's really dumb. And by the way, I'm a classic case example of it. I take, I've taken plenty of risk in my days, especially motor at risk, especially low acro risk. And so we'll, we'll transition from the low or from the motor at risk to the low acro risk. Wing, wingtip drags. Wingtip drags is a low acrobatic maneuver where your wingtip is below. I think it's like acro is defined by 45 degrees or something like that. It's an acrobatic maneuver. It's high risk. It's less risky on smooth surfaces. It's definitely more risky on rigid, rocky, rough surfaces. On the day that I crashed, I was wingtip dragging a surface that I had no business wingtip dragging. I knew better. I knew it was a snaggy, snagging hazard. I snagged my wing. It drug me in. I didn't need to wingtip drag. I knew I didn't need to wingtip drag. Two days prior, I had done a similar dive, only stopped with my wingtip three feet above the ground. And... The risk between your wing being three feet above the ground and your, and your wing being touching the ground or, or touching the ground is huge. The difference in risk is huge. The difference in pleasure is not a lot. And, and you have to continue to ask yourself where this line is. How much risk are you willing to expose yourself to in, in a pursuit of reward? Uh, what was your saying? Low flying is so much fun. Michael, the conversation is not about not having the fun. The conversation is around how can you reduce your risk as much as possible while maximizing your fun as much as possible? Because it's also a law of diminishing returns. You're going to get 80% of the fun, right? The, the classic case, 80% of the fun, 20% of the way there. In order to get the remaining percent of fun, you have to take a huge risk. And I don't think it's going to be quite 80-20, but you're going to get a majority of the fun with, with without the majority of the risk. In order to get the remaining part of fun, you must get huge, huge risk. And that's also the case with like wingovers. Baby wingovers are not as fun as big wingovers, but they're not as risky as big wingovers. The difference in fun is not with wingovers... The difference in fun is, is definitely greater. The difference in re, or excuse me, the difference in risk is also greater. So your risk reward balance is still better doing big wingovers than it is doing big low acrobatic maneuvers. Because the difference in fun with low acro where you go high and where you don't go high is the difference in fun is not a lot. But the difference in risk is a lot. It's a conversation. It's a thought process. It's about weighing in your mind, worst case scenario, what can happen, okay? 
And it's about how can we reduce that? Now, it's not to say don't go do the things that are fun. Don't go take the risk. We're, we we want to have fun. We want to minimize our possibility. We want to minimize... We want to minimize the probability of, of impact. We want to reduce the chances of us getting hurt as much as possible. Uh, let's see. What did you say? I think most people don't know or think about the possibilities that could happen thanks to your time and knowledge, Trevor. Of course. I, you're right. I don't think people think about it. I don't think people talk about it. I don't think people know. I don't think the majority of pilots out there, even the majority of really good pilots, I don't think they know. Like, they don't realize. And... I don't like so, some of them definitely do, but some of them don't like you're, you're kind of blindly flying because here's one thing that, that happens that definitely happened to me when, when you're taking risk and you're doing these bigger maneuvers, as you continue to get away with them, the idea of the risk goes down. So if you do wingtip drags a bunch of times, all of a sudden you perceive wingtip drags as a lot less risky because you got away with it a bunch of times. Now in your eyes, the risk is different. Now, the way you fly, you don't view as risky. But if you stepped back and actually looked at it from, you could say, a statistical standpoint, it is risky. You're still taking big risk. Yes, your performance and consistency of performance is good, but you're still taking risk. And so you got all these people taking these big risks, doing these big maneuvers, flying really crazy that don't realize how dumb they are. Not, it's not how dumb they are because they're not dumb. It's how much risk they're taking and not realizing how much risk they're taking and or being willing to take huge risk that's unnecessary. Like one risk point that I just absolutely will not do is flying low over the ocean. I will not fly over the waves. Flying next to the crashing waves is a really cool thing. I will not freaking do it. I recently watched somebody who's a very, a very intelligent, skilled, knowledgeable, experienced pilot do that. They are willing to do it. No way I'm willing to do it. Way too much risk for me. Either his risk tolerance is far higher than mine, or he's unaware or ignorant to or ignoring how much risk he's taking. More conversations like this should happen. More discussions should happen. More analyzing of situations should also happen. There should be a lot more time spent analyzing these these rare cases these possibilities more time spent analyzing your own flights like hey man let's watch this video and let's discuss all let, let's look at the situation let's discuss all of the possible worst case outcomes let's discuss in those worst case outcomes what's going to happen what's the probability of it happening and then let's make a decision if you still want to do that right it's it's scary to me how many people are taking all of this big risk all the time. How are people not getting hurt more often? That's the question I ask. How are more people not getting hurt more often with how much risk people are taking? Anyways, constantly refine your personal line of risk reward. Here's something that's interesting. Your line of risk reward is going to continually shift and move. It will never stay planted in one spot unless you have written out exactly where that line is. Unless you have drawn in the sand, written down, and hold yourself accountable to that drawing in the sand. Because in August, when I crashed, that line in the sand that I had mentally drawn for myself moved. And now the risk that I was willing to expose myself to, now the risk that I was willing to take, was really high. Even though four months prior, I had been adamant and discussed at length, passionately, about this the same conversation we're having now, about risk and the risk people were taking and, and how stupid it was. And then I fell for it. And, and that led to me crashing. And... I'm just surprised that more people aren't crashing. It, it, uh, it didn't, I don't know if it changed my mind about risk, Kurt. I, I think instead of changing my mind, it, it re-stimulated my mind to think about it. It, it, re, it reassured things that I had already thought. 
it, it brought things to attention. It made things very clear. And it then made sure that I can't change the opinion <laughs> as much as I thought. And maybe it changed it. Probably did. Probably did. I'm, uh, it's one thing that I'm doing to, to, to potentially... Re one, one thing I am considering doing is upsizing all of my wings. Because upsizing all of my wings would reduce some risk in some situations. It would change some things for me. There would be, you could say, negative consequences to upsizing wings. Like all of a sudden, I'm going to fly slower. I'm going to roll slower. I'm going to do all of those things that are, that I, are fun, are, are going to be less. But if I have a motor out, the landing is going to be softer. If I have to glide somewhere, the glide slope is going to be better. If I have to land in no wind, the landing is going to be better. If I have to land downwind, crosswind, sidewind, whatever, it's going to be better. And upsizing in wings is, I don't think should be frowned upon. I think it should be encouraged. If you look at a lot of old timers, people that have been flying a long time, like Chris Santa Croce or, or Boyd Stratton the, or even Dell, uh, th these people all have upsized in wings, right? So they, in, instead of, like, I'll look at Dell because I, I, I know Dell's situation better because I, I was close to him. Dell used to fly 19s and 16s all the time. Within the year, the year before I left, he upsized everything to 21 or 23s because he understood that if he had to have a motor out and had to run it out at his, at his age with his current physical capabilities, it was going to be way more unpleasant on a 16 or on an 8, on a, a 19 than it was going to be on a 21 or a 23. And so the conversation that I have with myself is, is considering upsizing wings for the same reason. It, it, because of my ankle now, I don't exactly know uh, what's going to what they're going to be like in the long, long term. I imagine they're going to re return to full recovery, just like my right one already has. My left one is not yet there, but it's getting there. Um, but considering a potential upsize in, in wings, I, I, like we're in this constant pursuit of increasing our performance. We're not in a constant pursuit of increasing our safety. We're in this constant pursuit of increasing our performance. If you think about it, everybody's in this pursuit of, of flying either smaller wings or hotter wings. And often the hotter wings are also smaller wings. And this pursuit of more performance is, is exactly what it is. You're pursuing more performance, but you're often sacrificing something in that pursuit of performance. And that could be your, your safety, your motor out landing speed, your, your glide slope, your, your dive arc, all of these things that are now different. They're, they're very different as you go down in size. So we're not in pursuit of an increase in safety. We're in pursuit of an increase in performance, which is not necessarily wrong. It's just a thing to think about. And it's a question to ask yourself, where is the line in the sand for you? Where do you want to take it? Do you want to be flying on the hottest wing and the smallest size taking just more baseline risk or not? And how much performance do you really need or not? Like I've considered switching back to a Spider 324 for two reasons. Number one, to show people, hey, you can have all the fun that you're having on your hot wings on a Spider 3. And number two, so there's a lot less risk on a Spider 3. You put me in a nasty situation. You put me in intense rotor. You put me in strong thermic conditions. You put me in a gust front. I'd so rather go through those environments on a Spider 324 than on a free ride 16. I'd so rather that. Yes, I don't have as much fun, you could say, but what percentage of fun increase am I getting on that free ride? And what percentage of risk increase am I getting on that free ride? And... Look, at this point, I'm rambling, and hopefully it's making sense to you. But also, hopefully, you're, you're taking this and you're thinking about yourself, and you're thinking about situations, environments, and, and your style, your flying, your decision-making. Every minute in aviation, you're making decisions that you're betting your life on. Okay, So every minute you fly, every second you fly, you're making a choice in which you're betting your physical life on. You're also making those choices before you launch. And those choices you make before your launch will set you up for the choices you have to make once you launch. If you make good choices before you launch, you don't need to make hard choices after you launch. Um, okay. That was a lot. 
Do you guys have any questions, comments, or inputs onto what it is that I just discussed? Because as you can see, oh shoot, my chair broke. Mike, it happened. <laughs> as you can see, this is a conversation I've been having with myself a lot. Um, I just broke my lawn chair, so we're gonna switch chairs. I knew this was gonna happen, so I brought it back up here. But I'm gonna sit a little higher now, so I'm gonna have to scoot this up. There we go. Yeah, so my lawn chair that I've been 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 sitting at, I, I broke. Look at that. This this broke a while ago, and then then this was holding it on, and I just I just broke that. <clears throat> that lawn chair has done a lot of a lot of good work with me. But all right, let's see. I missed some comments, so I'm gonna scroll back and see what comments I missed. Let's see. Why take the risk? I'd rather be able to fly when I'm super old and grumpy. Okay, so so that's actually a good point. Why take any risk? So let's think about that for a second. Let's just assume that you don't want to take any risk at all. You want to, if you don't want to take any risk, you can't be in aviation. I'm just going to say that. There's a default level of risk that is taken when you enter into the sky. When you forfeit, when you, when you are no longer standing on the ground and you are flying in the sky, your level of risk is higher, no matter what. And every second of that flight, you have to make choices. Those choices determine the outcome of that flight, right? So you choose to turn downwind right off launch, or you don't. You choose to have more altitude the whole time, or you don't. All of these choices are changing your risk. Now, the other things you can do to change your risk is what are you flying? Your, your, your wing that you're flying, your motor that you're flying can alter the risk that you're taking. If you are flying a highly overloaded 16 meter free ride two, you are obviously going to take more risk than if you're flying a Mojo 26, Mojo 226. Right, so, so what you're flying is gonna change that. That's a question you should ask. What level of risk increase is worth the performance increase on what you're flying? For me, I'm looking at my 18s and considering switching to 20s because that's going to have a shift in the level of risk by default that I'm taking. My default baseline level of risk is going to reduce, is going to go down by switching up a size for me. Now, if you're on a 26, switching to a 28 is not going to have nearly as much change because an 18 for me and no wind is at max run. A, a 20 is going to bring that down a lot and it's going to be a lot more comfortable. A 16 would bring that up a lot and I would be past my max run comfort and it would be a lot of risk. So, so there's that. The other thing that you can do before you fly is the, the choices of where you fly, when you fly and the weather you fly in, right? So, so are you flying from a really tame, calm, good LZ with lots of outs? Or are you flying from a high-risk LZ that's really tight? Uh, are you flying in good conditions only? Or are you flying in really nasty, extreme conditions? Those two choices are obviously going to change your risk. So if you're going to fly in a really nice LZ with lots of space, lots of good motor outs, and good wind conditions, you know, good weather conditions, your risk is a lot less. But if you're going to fly in a really tight LZ with tall trees and strong wind with gust front conditions, your risk is going to be a lot more. So you can change that. You, your decisions change that. Then when you're in the air, you can change a lot of things as well. You can change how you fly, the altitudes in which you fly at, the level of bank angle you're willing to take at certain altitudes, the, the amount of maneuvering you're willing to do at certain altitudes, the amount of maneuvering you're willing to do, the amount of distance you're willing to go, the amount of motor out risk you're willing to take, all of those are decisions. Now, back to the original question. Why take risk? We are flying paramotors in the pursuit of joy and fun. We are flying them because they are a fun, enjoyable thing for us. For some people, for us to get that level of fun that we crave, we need to do more extreme things. I'm not saying the adrenaline junkie. I'm not taking it that far, but I'm saying for some of us to have the amount of fun that we desire to have, we want to fly 10 feet off the ground, five feet off the ground, not 50. Some people are going to have all the fun in the world at 50 feet. Some people are not going to have all the fun in the world at 50 feet and need to be at five feet or want to be at five feet. There is a point, a lot of diminishing returns in how much risk you take. 
But there's some risk that's to be taken in this pursuit of fun. And it's okay to take some risk. It's, okay, it's, it's totally okay to take the risk as long as you are aware and understanding of the risk you're taking. Why take risk? It's more fun. Why fly low? It's more fun. Why do maneuvers? It's more fun. Why fly paramotors? It's more fun than not. That's a question for you. That's a question of where that line is in the sand for you, where you want that line to be. For me, I want to do maneuvers. I want to fly low. I want a foot drag. I want to do all of those things. That's what I like to do. That's the thing that, that brings me the fun. And maybe that's not the thing that brings you the fun. And, and yes, this is definitely reaching a point of rambling. Let's see. The wing acts differently in 4K than around 1K. It seems like it. Yes, altitude is definitely going to have an effect. Now, a couple things with altitude that people don't think of. Your altitude changes more than just your climb rate and more than just your launching and landing distance. Your altitude also changes your efficiency. It also changes your dive. It also changes your wing over energy. It also changes how high you can go in wing overs. It also changes how much altitude you eat up in dives. It also changes all of these things. So altitude can bite you if you're not aware of it. If you're used to pulling this amount to dive at this altitude to miss the ground by this much this, this much room, well, at altitude, that's all different. If you do that same thing at 5,000 feet and zero feet, well, at zero feet, you're going to be 10 feet higher than you were at altitude in a hypothetical. So you need to be aware of altitude and the effects that it has on you. You need to be aware of it, especially as you're starting to fly in a more aggressive style, like maneuvers low. If, if you're doing maneuvers low, you are eating up a lot more altitude at altitude than you are eating up at sea level. And if all you do is fly at sea level and you move to altitude and you fly like you used to fly, it could bite you. Now, the other thing that happens at altitude that I recently thought about is collapse recovery is worse at altitude than it is at sea level. And it's, it's worse at altitude in the sense of altitude loss in the recovery from the collapse. A collapse at sea level will, will probably, this is just my theory, probably take less altitude to recover than a collapse at, at 10,000 feet, 5,000 feet. Now, use that information how you'd like, but if you're taking collapses at altitude versus taking collapses at sea level, you're going to need more altitude, plain and simple, because your wing is going to need to refill with air, and in order to refill with the same amount of air, it needs to go through more air because there is less air. Anyways, let's see. Safe low flying. That's fun. You want to fly to live another day. I'll, I'll tell you this as well. I think you can fly low in an aggressive stamp, aggressive way without taking hardly any risk. Like, I should really make a video about that. I can sway back and forth and play and do all of those things low, under 30 feet, under 15 feet, and take very little risk. And with just a slight change, I can fly at that same altitude in the same way and take so much more risk. There's a way to fly low and have low risk. There's a way to do it. You have to think about it. You have to put these hypothetical situations of, oh, the motor, the motor died. Now what? Oh, you mean if I go diving this way at this altitude and the motor dies, that's going to be a that? Okay, well, well, give me five more feet and all of a sudden it's not that. There's a way if you start to think about and you start to actually go through these hypotheticals of lose, this is me dumping the power, losing the power, which is really the big risk. Well, it's not really the big risk. The big risk is also a lack of, of proper calculation of your dive. And that comes in a lot of different things. So that's a different conversation. But there's a way to have the low play without any risk. Not any risk. Without high risk. Without a lot of risk. You can safely fly low and have fun flying low and do all the fun things low without taking big risks. Motorcycles are similar. Yep, I like your crash perspective. Yep, any PTSD from the crash? No, uh, no PTSD from the crash, actually. I've been flying since then. I've flown my own wing. I've, I've definitely haven't been flying to the level I was flying in terms of aggressiveness, but I, I don't have any PTSD. I did, um, I, I actually, when I was flying once, I dove down like a wingtip drag, but I was at 10 feet and didn't have any ground rush fear. So no PTSD. 
from what I've seen. Do you teach an advanced class for intermediate pilots? Absolutely, I do. Anybody is welcome to come to the advanced classes. I, I rebranded them progression classes. I've been meaning to do that for a year. Anybody is welcome to come to those progression classes. The whole goal of that class is that you buy four days of my full undivided attention as well as the other instructor's full undivided attention. How can we help you? What can we teach you? What what can we do to better you as a pilot? Whether that's, that's um, ground education, whether that's kiting, whether that's flying, specific things, how can we further your education? How can we make you a better pilot? How can we give you better judgment, better skills, better experience, better knowledge, what can we help you with? That's the whole point of the progression class. Anybody is welcome from two flights to 200 to 2,000. No rambling, it's real life. I think I can speak for most of us. We're here for it. I'm glad to hear. Most of you have stuck around for the whole ramble, so I imagine you guys are probably enjoying it. Risk versus reward on lawn chairs. Yep, still safer than COVID. What's the difference between full bar trimmed in and full bar trimmed out? Good question. Agreed, agreed, always game of outs, always. Uh, whether young or new or old, believe me, this young man has wisdom in this sport tenfold. I have witnessed some crazy, sophisticated, awesome flying from him, hands down, one of the best. I, I really appreciate that. Uh, agree, sky, fly, sky Hiker. Yes, a game of outs is, the, you'll have to play the game of outs at all times. You can take additional maneuver risk, but you shouldn't take additional maneuver risk with addition of out risk. Uh, motor out risk. If you're going to take additional maneuver risk, at least reduce your motor out risk while you're doing it. Don't take big motor out risk and big maneuver risk. So one place, one one, one thing that I th I think um, I, I think one thing that people don't think about is is when they're flying low and they go really high up. If you have a motor out right there, and you're low, like that could be that, that that's game over. You should never fly in a spot where a motor out is game over. That's one thing I have decided to change because motor outs are unpredictable. I'm horrible. I'm not horrible at motor maintenance, but I don't, I do not obsess about it. And like I noticed as I was flying around and doing these motor off simu simulated motor outs, like, dude, there's some situations where a motor out can take you out. Motor out can be a fatality. You should never be flying in a way where a motor out can be a fatality where you want the motor out to be in terms of risk, that's a question for you to answer. Whether you want every situation that you're in at all times to be a nice soft landing into the wind, or whether you're willing to take downwind motor out risk, or whether you're willing to take the possibility of sprained ankles, rolled ankles, broken leg risk, that's a question for you. One thing I will never be willing to do is I never want to go through a fatality. I don't want to kill myself. Uh, so I'm not willing to take motor out risk that would kill me. I'm also no longer willing to take motor out risk that will hurt my legs. I will tell you, I spent a month in a wheelchair. I spent an additional month on crutches. I would like to keep my legs. I did not enjoy my time without them. In every aspect of life, paramotoring, driving, working out, everything, I have slightly altered the way I view things it, because I realize how fragile our bodies are and how easy it is for you to hurt yourself. And so when it comes to motor outs, the reason I'm also, the, well, to, to go into further conversation about why I'm willing to change wing sizes, if I go up a wing size, it reduces the risk of sprained ankles, reduces the risk of hurting a leg, it reduces a leg of a risk of, of any of those things by quite a bit. Just by going up in size, fly identically, 18 or 20 meter, 18 or 22 meter, and let's just say 18 and 20, flying style identical, flights identical, environment identical, everything identical, you are at less risk on the 20 of a motor out hurting you. And there's a law of diminishing returns. If, if you're on a 24 versus a 26, it's not going to be that big of a difference. But for me, who's pushing the envelope of small, who's maximizing the, you know, the smallest wing I can, you know, motor out on an 18 where I have to land crosswind in a farmer's field, like that's not, that's not fun. That's not safe. Like there's a high probability of on a trike rolling it. And if I roll a trike, what's going to happen? Well, there's a possibility of me hitting my head on a rock and getting a concussion 
There's a possibility of me snapping it at full wrist. There's a lot of possibilities. And if I land foot launch and I face plant, what are the possibilities and what are the risk points and, and, and what's a worst case scenario? Switch a wing size one up and all of that changes. But on the downside, on the, con the opposite side, you switch a wing size and the amount of fun that you have changes. So there's a balance, and I don't know where the balance is, and I'm trying to figure that out for myself because I don't know what wing size I actually want. I don't know what wing size I'm going to have. I currently have an 18. It's too small. For a trike, at least, it's too small, especially as I put on more weight. And it's muscle, thank you. I'm not getting fat on you guys. And I don't know... I don't know where that line in the sand is for me anymore because where the line used to be is no longer where the line is. And I think there needs to be a default line. Like when, so the other thing, when you're an instructor, when you're an instructor, you have the ability of setting the outline for the students. They may not listen, but you have the ability of drawing the line in the sand for them. And I don't think enough instructors realize the importance of that. And really, you have the opportunity to do that once. Doing it a second time, changing where that line is in the sand is difficult because once the line gets drawn, from what I've seen, it's hard to shift the line. Chasing top speed in PPG is f f food fiddle. One point, you may as well hop on a sport bike. Tandems might be nice. You can experience the joy of first flight and be slow. Yeah, tandems are fantastic. Wait till you get old. Oh, I'm sure. Um, anyway, so when you're an instructor, this is one thing that I've noticed. And one thing that kind of makes me, whoops, makes me nervous about a lot of instructors out there is you, you as the instructor, you are passing on the knowledge that that pilot is going to use to make critical decisions that they are then going to base their life on. They're going to bet their life on. You are drawing the line in the sand where they are going to say yes or no to doing something that they are then betting their life on. And people don't take that serious. People also don't take which instructor they want to draw that line in the sand for them serious enough because you don't know where to draw that line. And that line needs to get drawn for a slew of different things. And you need to have it not only drawn, but written, and you need to have the explanation as to why. And that explanation needs to be as to why based on real world experience in my eyes. So if you don't have that line drawn in the sand, you don't know. Now you have to figure it out. You have to learn where that line is for you. And that might be part of the influence into why we see so many people taking so much risk because they didn't have someone to help draw that line and they don't yet know where the line needs to be because they haven't been bitten yet. Ultimately, the only reason, not the only reason, but a large reason as to why I'm even having this conversation is because I did get bitten, bit. The, the universe bit at me. It snapped at me. And, and I'll tell you, it snapped at me and only barely hurt me. I will take it because it said, hey, you need to think about this. You need to, you need to have a conversation. You need to stop for a second. You keep going down this. This is what the universe said to me. In my eyes, this is how I viewed it. It said, if you keep going down this path, the next snap is going to be way harder. And also for me, I feel like I have the opportunity and the platform and the voice to have these conversations and to help others draw that line in the sand. And, and, I, and I, want, I want to do that somehow. I don't know how. I haven't exactly figured that out. I'm writing a whole slew of accident reports. I'm writing a whole... I'm not rewriting um, my ground school entirely, but I am going to recreate that. I have, I have, I'm going to add to it, change some things. I also wrote a ground school book. It's 95 pages. It goes into detail about a lot of these things things that I don't see anybody else having conversations about. It's scary to me. I'm nervous. I'm nervous for, for a lot of pilots that I see because I'm watching them take 
big risk, make decisions that I don't think they even realize they're making. And, you know, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm rambling now. I'm losing my train of thought. My brain juices are, are slowing. <laughs> Come on, brain. Think better. <laughs> think better. Think better. I, I, okay, so also, back to the 360 camera. I, I'm a big advocate of this because if you do film yourself, you will catch yourself taking these risks. You will watch yourself do it. You can actually watch it and say, whoa, hey, man, right here, minute 27 of my flight. Dude, if I had a motor out right there, that's not going to be good. Whoa, that dive at 42 was too low. That bank angle is too much for any amount of altitude below X. It, it gives you the opportunity to actually see, and you need to see. And you need to, to have, you have to visually see it. You have to sit down and you have to actually analyze it. You have to look at it. You have to, you have to see what you're looking at. And you have to say, hey, that is one thing. And I would strongly encourage you to actually take notes. I now take notes, physical notes. I write a report on it. I also do bullet point notes that I can review on later. Like, hey, okay, whatever. I crashed into the wheat field. Why did I crash into the wheat field? Well, it's not just that flight that I must analyze. I must go back and analyze the sliding slope of my risk exposure, willingness to take risk. I'm so willing to take, my, my willingness to take risk is climbing over a period of time because I was allowing myself to take risk in this environment, which was a thought planned thing, but I never dialed it back afterwards. I then paid the price because that risk continued to climb and I got sloppy, ultimately was flying a, as a tired pilot in an environment that, that was new to me. I dove way more than I should have been doing. I was not fully on my game. I, I should have been aware of that because here are three signs that I could have noticed as to me not flying on my top game. And anyways, that jet ski chase I did was insane. So so yeah, so there's, there's like, anyways, I'll get back to that in a sec. Uh, there's a thought process around like that crash. Well, there's, there's a lot of other things that you can analyze. You don't have to analyze just the bad. Analyze the good. Analyze the 23 touch and goes I did in the video I posted recently where it's like, hey, okay, on that touch and go, I noticed coming in with a little bit more speed and a little less break, I actually set down softer and was able to regain control of the wing better. And without looking up to the left, I'm not favoring the left side nearly as much, but still keeping control Okay, I'm not taking off access, off access. However, I am noticing right off takeoff, I'm initiating a turn low enough that a motor out would not be pleasant and there would be no time for me to process the situation, only time for me to immediately respond and turn into the wind. However, five more feet of altitude and my risk would be less. Boom, I filmed it. I can actually look at it. I can think about it. I can process what I'm doing, the decisions I'm making in the real world instead of just a hypothetical because you're not going to remember correctly. You're not going to remember correctly. Try and remember your flight an hour later. Like, you're not going to remember the flight an hour later. That's why it needs to be filmed. That's also, uh, like, that's why I'm a big advocate of that. That's why I would highly recommend it. I recently did uh, introduce a new package that we offer at Backcountry for new pilots. We call it the adventure package. It's the whole thing. See everything that you need. Included in that is a discount on a 360 camera. And I encourage and have encouraged everybody that has placed the order for it to get an Insta360 because it's super important that you can analyze, that you can actually break down everything. Good, bad, ugly. Crashes, face plants, butt landings. Great takeoffs. All of it. Anyways, now back to what you guys said. I haven't drank any water this live. You're right. I haven't drank any water and I have been sweating. But my voice is held, held firm, which is pretty good. And we are, what, almost two hours in again? This is exactly why progression training is key. We, the newer pilots, don't know. You're right. You don't know what you don't know. The other thing is, the other thing, there are very few pilots out there that will have this conversation with you because there are very few pilots that actually understand it. There are far too many instructors I see taking huge risks, unbeknownst to them. They don't realize it. They're taking huge risks. Huge risk. They're also setting a tone in their students' mind that's unsafe. They're like, 
lead by example to some degree, to some degree. And, and, and they're out here doing these really crazy, stupid things. And, and they don't know. They're not, they're not having these conversations with you because they don't have the experience. They don't have the understanding themselves. And there's just, it's, 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 it's nerve wracking in some sense because they are drawing the line in the sand. I know I said I was going to go an area, but then they got on a tangent. They're drawing, every instructor helps draw the line in the sand for you until you figure out where you want your line to be. You lean into your instructor to help you draw that line. So as an instructor, you need to draw that line and you need to know where to draw that line. Most people will not even draw you a line will not even tell you where you need to draw a line, why you need to draw a line, or what lines you need to draw, because they themselves don't know. Now, what's scary to me is that a certain somebody, who will not be named, make a lot of comments very close to what I'm just saying. That's all I will add to that. I don't know what conversation they are having. You don't know what conversation they are having. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to that in a second. Does Backcountry offer any SIV classes? No, we do not. Yo, the jet ski chase was, was, was cool. The jet ski chase was one of the riskiest flights I've ever had. It was arguably one of the stupidest flights I've ever had. I guess they're counting on them. I guess you were counting on them to rescue you if you went in for re whatever reason. Yes, I was counting on them to rescue me. When are the brakes coming out? I'm not sure. I have a prototype in my truck that I need to go look at. Thank you for your time and knowledge. You're welcome. Is there a specific Insta360 you recommend? Yes. Insta360 X3. Insta360 X3. You said you were going to go an hour ago. I did. I went on a tangent. It's because you care. Thank you. To be fair, you don't know what conversations they're having. I want to talk about that, Mike, because to some degree, you're right. But also, I get six advanced training students a month that come through here from different schools. All different schools. I've had the big names that everybody knows to the little guys. Students from these people. Now, these are no, not going to be like the, the, maybe they're not the cream of the crop. Maybe they didn't listen on the ground school, whatever. But I've had these people and I know where the lines are drawn in their mind. I know what they know. We have the conversations. And from that, I've, I've learned how little most people know and how little most people are taught and how there isn't the lines in the sand and how there isn't these conversations and how there isn't an outline for you to follow and there isn't this this almost like a, a checklist for you to follow to cross check and there isn't all of these things and, and the only reason i i at all know what they're saying is because and and it's reliant on these people's being truthful is because i'm having their students come through my advanced classes a lot of instructor students are coming through these advanced classes. A lot of them are coming through in a pursuit of getting this information because they don't have it. So I'm helping draw these lines in the sand. Now, on top of that, I also know the instructors. I know a lot of the instructors out there. I, I don't exactly know what they teach. You're right. Some of them I do. Some of them I don't. Some I've sat, on, sat in on their ground schools. Some I have not. But I've got a lot of their students. And your student is a good example. Um, your student is actually, students are the result of your training. You may not have said, you, you may have said something. You may have articulated, hey man, you shouldn't fly in this. But if they still choose to fly in that or they chose to fly in something that they shouldn't have flown in, ultimately that boils back to you in some sense, the instructor, because they relied on you or your information. They relied on on your line in the sand. They relied on the knowledge you gave them to make a judgment call to do something. So they leaned into what you taught them to make a decision. And if that decision is bad, that ultimately, in some sense, boils back to the instructor failed to either educate them on something or they failed to actually teach them the thing that they tried to teach them. 
or they didn't even teach them the thing. I will give you an example, okay? I had, I, I had a student in the last couple of weeks throw a reserve because he got caught in really strong rotor. Now, we can look at this in a couple of ways. And I'm going to do a whole debrief on this. And I actually wrote a four-page debrief paper on it that if you would like, I will share with you. But this student chose to fly in conditions that maybe he shouldn't have flown in. Well, actually, he chose to fly in conditions he shouldn't have flown in. And ultimately, it led him to a really nasty situation where he needed to throw his reserve. So there's two things. Number one, he made a judgment call. Now, I don't have control over the judgment call he makes, but he's leaning into the information we gave him to make these judgments. He made a judgment call to flying conditions he shouldn't have flown in, and he threw a reserve. The decision to fly in those conditions was a poor choice. Upon making the poor choice to fly, he made several really good choices. The first choice he made that was really good is he gained as much altitude as he could. This altitude bought him time to throw his reserve. The second thing we taught him well was when you throw a reserve, how you throw a reserve, and to throw your reserve. The other thing is we made sure the reserve was installed. So, so the, 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 the reserve throw, okay, we, we actually taught that. That got across. He understood that. He, he went on and he, he demonstrated that he knew how to do that. The, the climbing and gaining altitude in nasty conditions so that you buy yourself as much time as possible to work out problems. Okay, that, he got that too. The choice to fly in conditions that were borderline. Borderline. What this means, what I, what I interpreted it as, is either he overlooked something, aka he skipped a step, or their cutoffs, the, the cutoffs that he had in place he ignored, or there weren't cutoffs, and he was left to guessing. Meaning, there's room for improvement on how we teach our weather classes. Because if you had painted the picture, he painted the picture of the day, to me, I would have said no. But to him, it was right there on the edge where he thought he could. And so there needed to be more firm cutoffs in place and there needed to be a checklist because there were several things that were neglected and not done. There needs to be a checklist that you actually follow through to checking weather. And if it comes back one red, seven green, you don't fly. Now, I don't know if that's the, the best solution, of course. This is in some sense a rambling and it does boil down to the pilot's decision to fly in those conditions, but he leaned into the information, knowledge, and, and experience he had gained from us to make that judgment call. Uh, and so we had an influence on it. We could have influenced it. We could have changed and altered the decision, right? Had we influenced in a different way? Had we presented different information? Had we presented it in a better way? Had we had a firmer cutoff in XYZ? Had we had a list for him to check, he wouldn't have missed a step. And those things would have led to him not making that poor decision that led to him having to throw a reserve. And you can look at it in two ways. Like, yeah, we, we screwed, we, we have room for improvement in some places in terms of how we taught X, Y, Z, but he threw the reserve and it worked. So we also taught him some good things. We have a pretty dang good weather class now. And I just realized that the one thing I also realized when it came to weather we have a really good weather class. We have a lot of really great conversations, and we talk about it for 10 out of the 10 days. Every single day we talk about it. But there are some places where it's left up to human judgment, and the, or just judgment, and that can have human errors. And, and you got to try and remove possibility for human errors as much as possible. you got to have firm things where there's not a, a maybe kind of thing. But... Anyways, to be fair, yeah, you need to shorten your brake lines. Love the video. Need to shorten my brake lines? Do it. I'm a, as soon as I'm done here, I'm probably going to go tie brake lines. I'm pretty sure somebody's here needing brake lines tied. Um, let's see. Was the reserve toss warranted? Was he actually going down? Yes, it was warranted. Now, now he could have easily prevented the reserve toss had he made correct inputs at correct times. But the 
failure to make correct inputs at the correct times meant that then the correct action was the reserve. And it did deploy and set him down safely. Have I ever thrown my reserve? No, I've never thrown a reserve. I have a feeling I will retain hope for too long. A reserve toss will, will merely be a ground blanket. Retain, oh, retain hope for too long. Oh, yeah. Well, okay, so retaining hope for too long means that you don't know exa the, the situations in which the answer should be absolutely throw. Because there's a few situations where you work it out. But there should be lines in the sand where, hey, man, if you are at 100 feet, your wing collapses and spins because it entered into a stall. You do not even try to recover it unless you have extensive SIV experience. No, no, no. You immediately throw the reserve. Okay, let's say you take, let's say you accidentally stall your wing at 100 feet. You're immediately throwing reserve. Let's say you do a wing over and you screwed up and you twist up in the lines and you start to spiral. You immediately throw the reserve. You do not hold on to the hope. If you have extensive SIV experience, that is different. If you have extensive SIV experience, you can ex get yourself out of situations. But see, we're not drawing the line in the sand for the pilot who has extensive SIV experience. We are drawing in the line in the sand for people who do not, who need the line in the sand because they don't know where their line is because they don't have the experience to have it. Okay, so let's draw, walk through a couple situations with reserve. If you twist up in your lines or you go through a line and you get put into a, a spiral, as soon as you get put into the spiral, you throw the reserve. You do not hesitate. This pilot entered into a big spiral, partially induced due to a lack of attempt to stop the initial spiral. Once in the spiral, grab and through because he was unable to make the input needed and did not have the time to attempt to make the input needed. Because if you have more altitude, that's a different story. But if you're low and you get put into a spiral and you try and fail to get yourself out of it immediately, throw. There's no time to not. So see, when it comes to throwing reserves, there needs to be lines in the sand where you don't question, where you just lean into, okay, here's the situation where that is the answer. A situation, I'm twisted in my lines. I'm now spinning towards the ground. I throw the reserve. I don't think about it. I don't wait. I don't consider, maybe I'm going to get out of it. No, you don't try to get out of it. You throw the reserve. Oh, I went through a line. Oh, you, you got pluck, plucked through a line. And now you're at 50 feet. You got plucked through a line. As soon as you get plucked through the line, you throw. Oh, you're at 50 feet and you twist up and it starts to turn you. No, you don't try. You don't try to recover it. You don't have enough experience to know how to get out of that. You don't have enough time to get out of it. You throw. Okay. I uh, will take off here. Thank you, Brian, for sticking by. I know this is a sensitive subject, but I have yet to see anything new from Dell. I watch his videos. I don't know what's sensitive about that. I love these line sessions. Really informative. Yep. Thank you. How long do you use your wing before replacing it? Uh, I mean, it depends on the wing. It depends on how you use it. 30 of you have still stuck around. Do you guys have any questions, any comments, any last things that you would like to talk about? Any last questions you have for me? Because I have talked about a lot of things. I hope you... I, I think I'm actually going to go rewatch this live stream and take notes on some of the things I said and see what I can even retain from this. But I hope uh, that conversations like this become more abundant in the industry as a whole. I feel like paramotoring industry is very wild west and risky. I feel like most people don't know and don't have these conversations, maybe because they don't want to, because having these conversations are a bit of a deterrent. You scare people away. Uh, like Dell's conversations scare people away, constantly talking about X, Y, Z. Conversations around bad situations, you could say, can deter people away from wanting to do it. Like if all you did is watch crash videos, it's going to deter you. But I also think there's not a lot of people in the paramotor industry that have that that think about this stuff. I think we just are like, oh, we you know we fly in good weather and we we, we like these wings because they're fun and you know whatever. I, I I don't know what I'm getting at here, but 
I, I encourage more conversations around these. I encourage more thought around these. I'm happy to discuss more of these topics. I'm going to be putting a lot of effort into creating content around these topics, to creating um, pages and documents and I'm going to make a lot of, of write-ups about crashes, incident reports, not only crashes, but good things, bad things, decisions, situations that could have gone bad. I'm going to make a lot of those things because I think a lot of people will benefit from them, and I, I hope you read them and find value in them. And hopefully something I said tonight will help you in the future, and I appreciate you guys. Let's see what your comments were. Good stuff, Trevor. Thank you. Good stream, man. I appreciate you and what you're doing. Safe landings. I appreciate that. I was basically asking about Dell. Is he okay? I've not seen any new videos from him in months. I watch all your videos. You have a great blend of advice and adventure. Adventure, thank you. You have prices on your site. Yes, I do. Show the video. Which video are you asking? Blend. Thanks, Trevor. Pleasure to meet you finally. Thanks for the information. I'm sure we all appreciate it. Have a great night. Thank you. How far away is comfortable if you see a helicopter? Above. Be above it. Ambassador for the support. A sport, any word on your smaller brake toggles, bro? Yeah, smaller brake toggles. Um, I was supposed to get a prototype. Oh, I'm a little low on the camera. I was supposed to get a prototype last this week, last week, the final prototype, like the last edition of, of what we're, we're trying to do. And it got that the timeline increased on, on the the timeline increased on the toggles because I moved and now we have to ship it. So now there's an additional, every prototype has a seven day shipping process or whatever it is to get to me. So it takes longer, but yeah. Um, masters of disaster plumbing and air. Did you listen to my whole talk about the reserve toss situation? Did you actually hear what I said about my weather cutoffs and, and, and how all of those things? Cause I have been meaning to have this conversation with you. Did you hear it or did you just step in, show the video? I, I might show the video. I might show the video. I am curious, though, to, to know if you heard it because for those wondering, I, I'm assuming I know who this is. And if uh, who I know that this is is – if who I think this is is actually who it is, he's the one that threw the reserve. Um, you always find a way to help me. I'm glad. Just stepped in 10 minutes ago. Okay, so you did hear the last little bit then about my conversation around the weather and my conversation around the decision-making and how we influenced the decision-making and judgment and choices and cutoffs and all of those things. Did you hear that part as well? Maybe, possibly. Came in late and didn't see the video. Paramotor Maryland, I did not show the video because the video is on my phone and my phone's filming it. Good, okay, well, hey. Uh, Tim, and I know who you are now, um, I'd love to have, uh, well, I plan to have a phone call conversation with you discussing more of these things and furthering into this. 100% your fault. Sure, it's easy to 100% bl blame the pilot. Ultimately, yeah, it was your decision, but, 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 but you leaned into the knowledge and information you had been taught to make the decision to fly in that environment. Now, you could have ignored what we taught you and still flown in the environment or just overlooked and still flown in the environment. But what we taught you, you used to help you make that decision. And that, that, and that's why I'm going to put a lot more effort into some of these things. I'm going to make more of a, a checklist and a more firm line in the sand for people because I, yeah. I don't, I don't want that to happen to anybody again. Anyways, guys. All right. I've been on here for two hours and seven minutes. Really great at talking for a long time. I appreciate you guys. Thank you. Take it easy. I know I've said I'm going to go twice. Here's my 360 camera. I highly recommend you get one of these and film with it. And every incident I've incurred damage from was wholeheartedly my fault. Human error is a reality. Absolutely human error is a reality. Human error is the reason most every crash happened. It's not going to be a lack of. It's not going to be malfunction from equipment. Your your motor's not going to blow up. Your paramotor's not going to blow up. Your wing's not going to blow up. No, no, no. You're going to have made a decision. You're going to have made several decisions that led to you encountering a situation that can be bad. Every crash, you made several choices that led you to that crash, 
And there could have been one choice that was bad. There could have been several choices that were bad. There could have been a really quick decision that you made that was really bad. It's it's a decision. You made a choice. You made an action. You took it. You took action on a decision you made, and and it led to the crash. It's it's human error. It's a very common thing. Well, excuse me. It is the most common. It's the reason people crash in aviation. Your paramotor is not just going to fall out of the sky, unless you put it in rotor, in which case you put it there. All right, guys, I'm out. Uh, my friend wants, still wants to do an information video of the nasty AWOC 3 collapse. You mean where he was trimmed all the way out and it blew up on him, or where his trim buckle got, one got let out and the other one didn't? Which one are you talking about? The AWOC 3 definitely had some flaws. But I was going to go. Uh, message me. Message me. All right, bye.